Okay, polyatomic ions and balancing equations. This is recommended for grade 10 science students that are you know, having a little bit of trouble with this concept. It's, uh, not, it's not overly difficult, but it's not overly uh, simple either. Uh, the best way to do this really is if you've got a periodic table in front of you. Um, I'm probably going to be doing a lot of it from memory, and it would be great if you guys could do that as well, uh, learning the, um, you know, the, the major families of the periodic table, the alkali metals, the alkaline earth metals, the halogens, and the noble gases. So we're not really going to deal with the noble gases, but basically those other ones and a few ones in between, um, learning um, their atomic numbers, their, their symbols, their names, and in particular, uh, for what we want to do, the charges that they make, the charges of the positive or negative ions. And of course, um, you know, everything that's in a particular family here, let me uh, just do something here. So like if you're looking at, so let's say, uh, lithium and sodium and potassium, right? These things that are in, in one particular family all have the same charge, right? In this case, plus one. Or if you're looking at, let's say, beryllium, uh, magnesium, calcium, all of these are alkaline earth metals and they all have a charge of plus two or two plus, depending on how you want to write these things. I don't really care. Um, and, then the, and then the other one that we, that we tend to, to memorize are the halogens, um, fluorine and chlorine and bromine and iodine. And these all have a minus one charge. All right, so these are the charges that the ions make. Um, positive ions, metals, tend to give their electrons away and therefore get a positive charge. And the non-metals on the right-hand side of the periodic table, gaining those electrons, uh, get a negative charge. And we're usually looking at plus one, plus two, plus three, or minus one, minus two, minus three. And then we need to see how these things come together, how they, how they, they bond, essentially. So... Uh, this is what we're going to talk about. Oopsie. Let's go to the next page. So, for example, let's take a simple ionic compound. All right. Let's talk about sodium, which is an alkali metal, and chlorine, which is a non-metal, a halogen. All right. If you learn that sodium is in the first group and chlorine is in the seven, all right, or actually what I really mean to say is if you learn that sodium has one outer electron, okay, sodium has an atomic number 11, and that means it's got two electrons in its first shell, eight in the second shell, and one valence electron, and it's not stable because of that. It's trying to achieve a full outer shell of electrons, whether that's two or eight, usually it's going to be eight. And same thing with chlorine. Chlorine is going to have electrons in its first shell, in its second shell, etc., all the way up to seven electrons in its outer shell. It needs to gain one. And this is why electrons will move, or an electron will move, from sodium to chlorine. By losing this outer electron in sodium, it is going to become stable. It's going to have a total of 10 electrons, two in the first, eight in the second shell, all right? And, you, and hopefully you've done Bohr diagrams so you can visualize this. Sodium is then going to be stable. Chlorine, gaining that one electron, is going to have eight electrons in its outer shell and be stable. But in transferring that electron, sodium will get a positive charge. Chlorine will get a negative charge, just one, because it's one electron moving. And it's that opposite charge that attracts them together, and they become a compound, an ionic compound, sodium chloride, an ionic compound held together by an ionic bond, which is the electrostatic attraction or the electric attraction between positive and negative ions. So the question that we need to deal with is how to write the correct formula. I mean, sodium chloride is the correct formula. It's not Na2Cl5 or something. And how do you know this? How do you know what the formula is? All right. So, well, let's have a look at this. So I'm going to come down here again, and I'm going to write sodium. Sodium has one outer electron, and it's going to give that electron away. I mean, you know, the metals on this side of the periodic table and the non-metals on that side, right? Metals are going to give electrons to non-metals. So it's just something that you have to memorize, essentially. 
And because sodium has one outer electron, it's going to give it away and it's going to get a plus one charge or a one plus charge. Chlorine, as we said, is going to gain that electron and gain one minus charge. Now that's the same for all of the halogens and that's the same for all the alkali metals. So what happens is one positive sodium and one negative chloride will attract each other in a one-to-one -one ratio. This positive one balances out with this minus one. Now, if we had two chlorines here, well, there's only one electron being given up, but if for some reason we could have another minus one chlorine here, all right, chloride ion there, the formula is not going to be NaCl2 because this adds up to two negatives and this adds up to one positive and that doesn't zero out or become neutral overall all right and this is what we're trying to achieve now it's sometimes called the zero sum rule we need to have the charges become neutral or zero out and so therefore we need one sodium and one chloride and the formula is NaCl for sodium chloride now, if we take potassium, which is also an alkali metal, and let's take fluorine, fluorine, a halogen. Because this is an alkali metal, it gains a positive one charge because it gives its electron to fluorine. Potassium becomes stable by losing that outer electron. Fluorine becomes stable by gaining it and it gets a negative one charge. Now, the reason the charges work like this is because in the atom, right? You've got the nucleus with a certain number of protons, let's say three. You've got some neutrons. They don't really matter very much, so we're not going to worry about them. And then orbiting the nucleus, you've got electrons with a negative charge. So I'll put two here, let's say. And let's say I go up to one more shell and I put another electron there with a negative charge. See the way there are three negatives and three positives. This is a neutral atom, but it's not stable. This outer electron is a problem for that atom. It's, it's just not stable. It doesn't have the correct number of electrons in the shell. The first shell here, it's filled with two electrons, but this shell here needs eight electrons to be full. All right. So when it's got the one, it's just, it's just not right. It's, it's not feeling good about itself. All right. So, I mean, you know, it can either gain seven or it can lose one. It's easier to lose one electron than to gain seven. So imagine if we come over here, see if I can erase that. Yeah, there we go. Good. Imagine that we get rid of that one electron. Okay. Can I do that? Ah, oh, very nice. Because that was an outer electron. It's easy to lose something on the outside of an atom. The nucleus, on the other hand, that's I mean, way down in here. That's not going to be affected by typical chemical reactions. It still has three positive charges in the nucleus. Those were the protons, right? But now it has two negative charges because of the electrons. So when you add these up, three positives, two negatives, you get an overall result of plus one. That's the overall charge on this ion now this charged atom because the protons don't change only the electrons change so when we come over here to this potassium and i say it gets a plus one charge that's because it loses an electron let's say to fluorine in this case but the protons don't change so it's got extra protons compared to the electrons it started with an equal number it's lost one negative electron so it has a net charge of plus one Fluorine, on the other hand, has a certain number of positives in the, pro in the nucleus due to protons, a certain number of electrons out here due to due, due, and causing negative charge, <laughs> and the positives and the negatives cancel out. But when it gains this one electron from potassium, it has one more negative than it has positives in its nucleus, and it gets a positive or a negative charge. 
So we have plus one for potassium, minus one for fluorine. So what are we going to do for the formula? What is the correct formula? Is it K3P2? Is that right? Well, it wouldn't be P anyhow. It would be F, right? K3F2. Is that the formula? No, it's just KF. One of these and one of these. One positive, one negative. It's neutral overall. Even though the ions aren't neutral, they're charged. But you put them together and they zero each other out. Now, people sometimes use, let me get rid of all of this. People sometimes use this cross down method to solve the problem. So if you had potassium here and you had fluorine here and you say potassium becomes plus one and fluorine becomes minus one. And then what they do is they take the, 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 this charge here and they put it down there and they say that's one get rid of the, the sign. Put this one down here, and it's one. Get rid of the sign again. You get K1F1, or you don't need a one if, if you know, in chemistry, you just KF. All right, let's try another one. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Let's take calcium and fluorine, all right? Calcium is an alkaline earth metal, and these are some of the things that you should just memorize instead of relying on the periodic table, although you typically have that for tests and exams and stuff. In time, you're just going to learn, you know, some of these elements, right? Well, calcium forms a plus two or two plus ion. It gives two electrons away. All right, and you can figure that out by knowing, well, the, the atomic number is 20, two in the first, eight in the second, eight in the third, two in the fourth. Oh, so it's got two electrons, two valence electrons that it can give away. So it becomes plus two. Fluorine is a halogen. They all become minus one. So what is the formula? Now, you can either, either do the cross down method or just start seeing it in your head that if I have an ion that has a plus two charge, and I have an ion that has a minus one charge, I'm going to need two of these things to zero this out, right? Two minuses, two plus. Ah, so the formula is CAF2, not CAF3. That, that doesn't exist. That doesn't work. It has to zero out or become neutral. Now, if you needed to use the cross down method, you would write this and you'd go two plus or plus two, minus one, and you'd cross these down and you'd put the two there, cross that down, put the one there, so you get CA1F2, or just get rid of the one, CAF2. So the cross down method will work, and it will also work with the polyatomic ion stuff, which is really what I want to talk to you about today. All right, so that's how you, that's how you do it. Um, if you had a slightly harder one, um, let's say you had calcium nitride. Now, you know, you may not memorize the nitrogen here, okay? Nitrogen, though, is going to form a minus three charge, okay? It's atomic number seven, two in the first shell, five in the second shell, so it needs three electrons. So it's going to either lose five or gain three. It's easier to gain three, so it becomes three negative. Calcium becomes two plus. Now, in this case, it might be easier to do the cross down method with the two going down here, the three coming down here. So the formula is CA3N2. That's an N there. And you can never go wrong if you do it this way. All right. And every time you see a formula for something, um, let's do this Na2O, sodium oxide. Anytime you see a formula, then analyze it and say, so why is it Na2O? Why not Na3O? Well, sodium's plus one, oxygen is two minus. Or you just either memorize that or it'll come to you over time. So I'm going to need two of these, plus two and two minus. That would zero out. So this is the right formula. It's not Na3O, it's Na2O. All right. So that's how you do formulas for simple ionic compounds. However, in the grade 10 course, we start to focus on these things right here. These are polyatomic ions. And polyatomic ions means that these are groups of atoms or ions that often occur together, very commonly occur together seem to have the need to circle all of them for some reason. 
um, they 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 occur together like a little music group, like a rock band, whatever. It's Nitrate tonight at the Las Vegas Inn, whatever. Um, and as a group, they have a charge. Now, I'm going to clear that so you can see this better. I might actually even write it down. Nitrate. Nitrogen and three oxygens in a group have a charge of minus one or just minus. Usually when it's minus one, people just write the minus. They don't write the one. Okay, just like if there was a one down here, you tend to not write it. This group is called the nitrate ion. It's a polyatomic ion, meaning it's made of poly means more than one or many. Okay, many atoms together in a common group. All right. Now, we saw a moment ago, I think I did, sodium nitride, right? And it was Na3N. This is just one nitrogen and three sodiums, okay? Now we're saying this nitrogen is with three oxygens, so there are four atoms in this group called nitrate and a minus one charge overall. Now, you either learn the charges on the common polyatomic ions or you're given to them in a table on a test. You just have to know how to use them. So if we look at carbonate up here, carbon and oxygen three times with a two minus charge. So one carbon and three oxygens instead of one nitrogen and three oxygens. And now there's a two minus charge. All right, that's just the way it is. All right, this group called carbonate is a polyatomic ion, okay? And notice, by the way, that many of these names are called eight. We're not talking ide anymore, sodium chloride. We're talking nitrate, carbonate. Now forget about this one, okay? Um, phosphate. Often when there, or maybe usually, or maybe always, when there's an element and oxygen together with it, it's called eight instead of ide. All right. Now, even if I do this, you go carbon dioxide, but this is just two different elements. This is not a polyatomic ion group. And you probably look at it and say, well, how do I know that? I mean, why is CO3 one and CO2 isn't? I can't really explain that to you at this point. Um, all I can say is look at the list of typical polyatomic ions get used to seeing the elements in them and the charge and start learning their names carbonate phosphate hydroxide well that's a little bit different all right it's a simpler one nitrate um so we're not going to worry about why this charge is here whereas normally we go okay chlorine is a halogen and it's going to have a minus one charge or just a minus charge there and we know why because of the valence and it's going to gain one we're not going to worry about that here just just go with the fact that carbonate has a two minus charge phosphate has a three minus charge just accept it and then learn how to use it okay so how are we going to use it well, let's, let's deal with carbonate. Let's do the formula for sodium carbonate. Okay, so sodium is Na, carbonate is CO3. Now, carbonate has a charge, let me do that in a different color, of two minus, right from the table. Sodium is not given in the table, we gotta figure that out. Well, it's an alkali metal plus one. How many sodiums and how many carbonates do we need to zero out, just like we did before, to, to get this to be a neutral ionic compound? It's an ionic compound because sodium is a metal. All of this stuff, these polyatomic ions, are made of atoms that are not metals. They're non-metals. Okay, a metal and a non-metal. Well, you can use the cross-down method if you need to. Bring the two down here. And then when you want to bring the one down here, what is that going to be 31? All right. Well, when you have a number beside a polyatomic ion, you have to take the whole group. Okay. I'll put darken in the one there. Okay. This Academy Award, this Juno Award goes to everybody in the group, not just to Oxygen, the drummer. All right. Or one of the three drummers. That'd be weird. Singer and three drummers. 
That would be cool. All right, anyways. All right, you, you, you see what I'm saying? Um, when there's a group of atoms, the charge or the, the number, sorry, goes to the whole group. It actually, so does the charge. This 2 minus applies to the entire group. See the 2 minus over here? That's for the entire group of atoms. This 3 minus for the whole group. It's not just for the oxygen. It's for the group. All right? Okay. So the formula becomes Na2... Well, here's the thing. When there is a one beside a polyatomic group, we don't even need to draw the brackets. It's just like, look, I'm taking it one time. Well, I've written it once. I don't need brackets to say I'm taking it once. It's just once. So we don't worry about that. But we'll do another one. Um, let's try um, sodium phosphate. Yeah, let's do that one because that's going to have a three in it. Okay, so sodium and phosphate okay sodium is plus one alkali metal phosphate is three minus or minus three i tend to write those differently each time okay so can you see in your head what you're going to need i've got three minus here i've got one plus here i'm going to need three of these to balance out one of these all right if you can't see it cross them down put a three here put a one here but it's not going to be 41 all right it's going to be like this okay but we don't even need to write the brackets na3 po4 okay three sodiums to one phosphate this is the formula for sodium phosphate and notice it's not sodium phosphide it's not the p alone it's the p with its band members its partners so it's called phosphate okay um i actually wanted to do something with harder numbers so let's do calcium phosphate calcium phosphate Calcium is an alkaline earth metal. What's its charge? Right. Phosphate? There. Okay. Now, we are likely going to need to cross these down. Three is going to go here. I need three calciums. Two is going to go here, but I'm going to put a bracket here. All right. That's four in there. So I'm going to have three calciums and two of the entire group. All right. So two three minuses is six minus. Three two pluses is six plus. There, they zero out. The formula is Ca3 bracket PO4 taken twice. Calcium phosphate. It looks complicated when you, you know, at, at first glance, but it's really not that bad when you know what you're doing. All right. Let's do some more. Let's do, uh, I don't know magnesium nitrate might be easy might be hard let's give it a try magnesium nitrate mg for magnesium nitrate no3 what's the charge of magnesium think about that alkaline earth metal two plus what's the charge of nitrate well it's right in the table minus one or minus cross them down one of these two of these oh wait a second not 32 i better put brackets here and you don't just leave it like that you got to write it properly so it's mg no3 taken twice you get rid of the one because when there's one of them you don't have to say hey i got one we can see you got one all right the reason this works out is because magnesium is two plus nitrate is minus one so I have to balance out the two plus. I'm going to need two of these. So this is two minus or minus two. That zeroes out MgNO32. All right. So this is called polyatomic ions. The whole group has the charge. And by the way, the whole group gets this number. So how many nitrogens do we have when I put a two there? This two multiplies by that. We have two nitrogens. And it multiplies by that number, so we have six oxygens. All right? So just remember, you multiply by everything in the group. 
Okay, so, I mean, that's a little review of, of polyatomic ions. I see I didn't do anything with hydroxide. Um, so, I mean, hydroxide just has a minus one charge, so it's pretty straightforward. Like, for example, um, you'll use this in the lab, sodium hydroxide plus one, minus one, that's all you need. This is an ionic compound, and that is a polyatomic ion. Now, this one happens to have the ide ending, hydroxide, whereas these are the eights. And there's other ones, and there's there's carbonite, and there's carbonate, phosphite, phosphate, nitrite, nitrates. So, I mean, there are other chemical formulas, but just don't let it freak you out. Just look at the chemical symbols, look at the charge, and say, I can do this. So, with respect to hydroxide, let's say we wanted to do calcium hydroxide. So, you'd start by writing this out. You'd go calcium's 2 plus, hydroxide is minus 1. I'd cross them down, and I, I see the 2's going to come over here. So, I'm going to put a bracket around this and a bracket around that, and I, I see I need 1 calcium for every 2 hydroxides. Does it make sense? two plus, ah, so I'm gonna need two of these to get two minus and it zeroes out. Calcium hydroxide, okay? So that's how you do the polyatomic ions. Now, with respect to balancing, um, I'll show you uh, some of this in another PowerPoint that I've got, but the idea is that if you've got a chemical reaction with A and B, and they're reacting together. These are called reactants, okay? The stuff that's coming together, reacting, is called reactants. And on the other side, what is made or produced are the products. The products, in this case, let's say A and B come together to make AB. This would be called a synthesis reaction. You have to have the same number and types of atoms on both sides of a chemical reaction. So if you have one A here, you can't get 12 A's on that side. Where did they come from? If I've got one dollar, it's not gonna become $12 or else I could retire right now. <laughs> All right, I'd be rich. I'd be like Donald Trump or something. All right, one A on this side, one A on that side. Oops, all right, that's good enough. A plus B produce AB. So if I've got one A here, I've got one A there. And if I've got two Bs here, I've got to have two Bs on this side, all right? Matter cannot be created or destroyed, just converted into other, other forms. And so this is about balancing chemical reactions. So for example, let's say we want to make some water, all right? We want to produce H2O right? Water molecule. Well, we're going to need some H and we're going to need some O to make this stuff. How many do we need? Well, you can see one water molecule on this side consists of two hydrogens. So I'm going to put a two here, two hydrogens. Now, would it have been wrong for me to do this? No. No, not really. Not that I can see, anyhow. Hydrogen gas, whatever. Either way would have been fine. I'm going to need two hydrogens and one oxygen. And this is a balanced chemical equation. Okay? There's the correct number of hydrogens on this side and hydrogens on this side, oxygens and oxygens, and that just got extremely messy. All right? So this is balancing equations. Um, let's say we wanted to produce hydrogen peroxide, which is another chemical that you'll be using uh, in the lab. Hydrogen peroxide is not the same thing as hydrogen oxide, which is water. Or dihydrogen monoxide, dihydrogen dioxide. This is also called hydrogen peroxide peroxide when there's an extra oxygen you often put the the per name in or the extra something per chloride per whatever <laughs> you'll do that in later chemistry i'm not that smart as a chemist to to go through all this stuff but if we had that okay how are we going to balance this equation well this one becomes pretty simple we essentially just need 
H2 and O2, and that's, that is a balanced reaction. Two hydrogens, two oxygens, and, and this is a balanced reaction. Now, I'm going to show you some that are a little bit more complicated because I want to talk about... My camera goes off when I've recorded for um, longer than, than 30 minutes. I can probably set that, but I want to talk to you about um, when we put numbers in front versus beside here all right these numbers in front are called coefficients and this is normally how we balance equations using coefficients so let me see what my other powerpoint looks like and see how helpful uh, that's going to be to teach this now i've actually got some other stuff in here and i'm hoping that uh it's all within the screen um, this is from a quiz that I've given in the past, um, and I've got the answers uh, here as well. So let me get rid of that. Okay. All right. So um, hopefully you can just barely see that, and I don't know if I can scroll this anyway. I'm just going to leave it like that because the important thing is is what's down down in here. Oh, that's not what I want to do. All right. So write the chemical formula for each of the following. Okay. This is a mixture of normal ionic compounds and using polyatomic ones. Oh no, maybe this is all polyatomic, sorry. This is polyatomic, hydroxide, nitrate, sulfate we haven't uh, seen. I didn't show you that in the list. Carbonate I did and phosphate I did. So let's see if we can figure out the chemical formulas and, and, and why they are what they are. So potassium hydroxide, okay. Potassium is K. Hydroxide is OH from the table. Potassium is plus one. Hydroxide is minus one. The formula is going to be KOH. And, uh, whoops, let me go to this. There it is, KOH. Calcium nitrate. Calcium nitrate. Calcium is two plus, it's a uh, alkaline earth metal. Nitrate is minus one. Put the two down here, the one down there, I'm gonna have one calcium, bracket, two of these, CaNO3 taken twice. And there you go. Now, lithium sulfate. I believe sulfate is two minus or minus two. So let's see if we can figure out how to write this one. Lithium is Li. Do you know what family it's in? Alkali metals. Sulfate is written like this, SO4. It's a polyatomic ion. There are five atoms in this group, and I believe it has a two minus charge. If it does, I'm gonna need two lithiums for every sulfate. Right? If I put a two down here, if I cross this down and cross that down, that one is not necessary. I don't need brackets. Li2SO4, and then what you would do is the correct formula is like this. You don't write them with the charges. This is how you do it. Li2SO4, let's see if I was right. Oh, so exciting. Li2SO4. Sodium carbonate, Na. I didn't want to write in PowerPoint. I want to use my little epic pen. Uh, sodium carbonate. Uh, carbonate minus is it minus one or is it minus two? Well, we're about to find out. Let's find out what the formula for that one is. Ah, it's it's two minus magnesium phosphate. I'll just show you that one. Okay. The reason for for that is um, magnesium over here, ah, darn it. Magnesium, two plus, phosphate, PO4, three minus, cross them down, we're gonna get three magnesiums, put brackets, two there, we're using the cross down method. There we go, check. Okay, cool. All right, so hopefully that's reasonably okay. How about this kind of thing? We have to give the name for these. Now, we haven't focused on names, and we actually have some, some different uh, ones here. Um, we haven't seen this one. We saw that one, and we saw that one. So this, calcium carbonate, lithium 
phosphate. But likely on a quiz or test, you would have uh, the names of these. You'd have a table with them. I believe this is nitrite. And again, I mentioned that there are different names, but we didn't specifically look at this. So don't freak out about like memorizing all of them. Uh, but I mean, if, you know, if it's NO3, it's called nitrate. All right. And if it's NO2, I believe it's nitrite. So let's find out if that's true. Potassium for K, nitrite. Now, I have a question for you. All right. Hang on. Nitrite is a new polyatomic ion, right? It is a polyatomic ion. Uh, you know, how do you know that? Well, you know, you've got the K, you're familiar with potassium, and this is a group, okay? And it happens to be called nit nitrite. Here's my question to you. What's the charge of the nitrate polyatomic ion? Never seen nitrite before. It's not in the table that we looked at, although it would be if you were doing a quiz or exam or whatever. What's the charge of nitrate? Well, there's one potassium, and potassium is plus one. And there's one nitrite group, and it has to zero out the potassium, so it must be minus one. This whole group here must be minus one to zero out with this. Otherwise, I mean, if the formula was like, you know, or, or actually, let me do it this way, okay? If, if the formula was K2NO2, all right, then you would go, well, potassium's plus one, so together that makes plus two in total there, right? So this must be two minus or minus two to zero out. So you, you can figure all these things out. Calcium carbonate is the name for this next one. Oops. All right. Lithium phosphate. Now, notice the formula. Okay. Get used to analyzing the formula and saying to yourself, you know, why is there three here? This is phosphate. This is a group. It's just the way it is. It's always together like that. Why are there three? Well, lithium is plus one. So that must be plus three or three plus in total there. And this, of course, is three minus. So that's why I need the three. Or if I knew that was three minus, I cross it down. The three goes there and the one goes there. And we don't worry about the one. So these formulas can help you learn the charge as well. For example, this is calcium carbonate. There's the carbonate. What's the charge of carbonate? Well, calcium's two plus, and there's one of those, so this must be two minus. Two plus, two minus, zeros out. Okay. Lithium phosphate. Okay, a little bit of balancing equations, all right? Um, the idea here is not for you to write all this down because I'm probably going too fast for that. Of course, if you're watching this uh, from home or from class and you can pause it and you want to write some of this stuff down, then, then by all means. Let's look at this chemical reaction. This is K2O, all right? Potassium oxide produces, you don't say equals, potassium plus oxygen. What we're saying is this compound is being broken down into potassium and oxygen. It's splitting up. Now, we're going to balance this, but I want you to notice something first. What's the charge of oxygen, the ionic charge? Well, there are two Ks. Each K is plus one. So that's a total of two plus there, right? So oxygen must be two minus, all right? Or you just have learned that. Anyways, all right, let's balance this. Let's look at balancing. Notice there are two potassiums as a reactant, but only one here as a product. That's not possible. I mean, unless you lost potassium, but I mean, it still exists in the world somewhere, all right, if you lost one. So we're not losing any of our atoms. They're written down on the page. So we're going to balance this. Now, I'm not going to write the two here. This is not how we balance chemical equations. We're not looking at a compound called K2. Although there are there is a two here, when it's within the compound, you can write the two there. That means I need two potassiums. It would be different if I wrote this, okay? 
2KO in a compound, all right? I've taken the two and I put it up there. If I do that, I don't even know, I'm hoping that's not off the screen. In fact, let me, let me rewrite that down here. If I write 2KO, because I want to represent the, the two potassiums another way, um, that means two times the potassium, but it also means two times the oxygen. That's not the right formula. The formula is K2O. We just said oxygen's two minus, potassium's one plus. We need two Ks to one oxygen. This is wrong. That doesn't work out. So the formula is the formula, and you can't mess with it, all right? But you don't go writing a two over here, all right? What we do is we write the numbers as coefficients in front when it's not a compound. So, I mean, I don't know if that's weird to you or you'll just get used to it. So, if I have two potassiums on this side, I need two potassiums on that side. I have one oxygen here, but I have two oxygens over here. Oh, I got a problem. If I have two oxygens here and only one oxygen here, I'm going to come back and I'm going to write two here. Now, once again, I see O2. So, the tendency is, well, I'm just going to put O2 there. What you're saying if you do that okay, is, well, there is a compound that exists, and it's called K2O2, but that doesn't make sense. You want to know why? Potassium plus one, that makes two plus. Oxygen's two minus. This would be four minus here in total, and this would be two plus. It doesn't zero out. That doesn't exist. So you can't just take the number and, and write it in there. That doesn't work. Instead, you're going to write the two in front of here. So now I have two O's, which is two O's. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, two in front of the O and two behind the O, all right? Just that you have to have essentially just the same number and type. So now I have two oxygens on each side, but the potassium is wrong. I had a two here originally. I actually need four. So I'm going to put four here. Two times two is four potassiums. All this is saying is if you have K2O, you have a couple of them, and you break it apart, the potassiums fall out and there's four of them in total and O2 comes out. It doesn't mean they have to be arranged the same way. This is actually a decomposition reaction, all right, where it breaks apart into its pieces, but you don't drop the pieces. You still have them. So you have to account for the same number on the left and the same number on the right. So let's go on. Sodium plus iodine produces sodium iodide. All right, sodium's plus one, iodine is a halogen, minus one, so this zeroes out, so this is going fine, all right? But we have two iodines as reactants, one iodine as a product. Now, this is trial and error, by the way, all right? So the, my first instinct is to go, okay, I'm gonna write a two there. Okay, wait a second, that doesn't make sense based on what I just said, right? Because if I have two iodines, each at minus one, it's a halogen again, or halogen, that's two minus, but sodium is plus one. I have plus one and two minus. That doesn't zero out. You can't just go throwing numbers anywhere. So instead, if I have two iodines there, I'm gonna write the two in front. That doesn't change the formula. It just says how many of them have I got. I've got two of these compounds called sodium iodide. So now I have two I's, two I's, but now I have two sodiums, so I've got to come back in front of here and go two there. This is now a balanced chemical equation, all right? Two sodiums and an I2 molecule come along and they shuffle around. This is a synthesis reaction, all right? We'll learn about those later, coming together to create two sodium iodides. All right, now, this one's going to be a little bit different. When you see a three of something on one side and a two of something on the other, often you're going to interchange. I'm going to multiply this one by three and this one by two. That's often how it will work out. But as you can see, I have one K and one CL, one K, one CL, but I've got the wrong number of oxygen. So I've got three and two. So it's trial and error. It might work the first time. I'm going to write a three in front of this one because that's going to give me six. And I'm going to write a two. Well, where do I do? I, I can't. I'm not going to write a two there. I'm not going to like, like, do that kind of thing. You might be wondering why, and I can't even explain why. Just don't do it. I'm going to put the two in front. So I wrote a three in front of this one and a two in front of that one. You swap them. All right. When you see a three and a two, 
Write the opposite. Just do it, and it'll often work. Six oxygens, two times three, six oxygens. Now I have two Ks and two CLs. I can put a two in front of there. Two K, two CL. This is a balanced chemical equation, okay? It's conservation of matter, all right? There's the same number and type of atoms on either side. We're not creating, we're not destroying, we're not converting potassium chlorate, is that what that is, into diamonds or else, again, we'd be rich, all right? We're not doing that. We have to conserve our, our, our atoms. Okay, what the heck are we going to do here? Trial and error, right? So let, let's look at this. P is phosphorus. doesn't matter whether you know that or not. I got four P's. I got four P's. Okay, that looks good. Two N's. Two N's. That looks good. Oh, six there and one there. That's messed up. So, so what are we going to do? Let's try putting a six in front of here, meaning six times this and six times the O. Okay, that's going to work. Okay, but now I've thrown off the nitrogen, right? I've got six oxygens, you're happy. Four Ps, you're happy with you. Six times that, oh, so if I just put a six there, is that 12 nitrogens, 12 nitrogens? I guess I just balanced it. That's it, balanced chemical equation. And by the way, okay, we don't need to go writing a one in front of things like that and a one in front of that. It's obvious in that case, okay? So there's that. Let's go on. C3H6 plus O2 as reactants produce CO2 and water as products. We are taking a hydrocarbon, something with carbon and hydrogen, and we are reacting it with oxygen. This will be a combustion reaction that we will see producing carbon dioxide and water. We are essentially burning this hydrocarbon in oxygen. We'll talk more about that later. Now, this one may not work out easily. I'm not that great at doing these either. I see I've got a two hydrogens and a six. I'm just gonna try dealing with the carbon first. I've got three carbons, so I'm gonna put a three there. Three carbons, three carbons. Now I've got six oxygens and I've got two, uh, two and three. See, this one's gonna give me some trouble. Maybe, maybe you guys can see this easier than I do, okay? It takes me time to, to get through these. Now I've got six, three oxygens, and three times two is six. What have I done? I mean, this is one of those troublemaking ones. I don't feel like doing that one right now. <laughs> That's the luxury of being a teacher. I don't feel like doing the complicated ones. You guys try that one. I'm doing the easy stuff here. Okay, zinc chloride, two H's. Can I just put a two there? Two hydrogens, two hydrogens. Doesn't matter if there's a two in front and the two below. Two CLs, two CL, one zinc. That's more like it for a retiring teacher. Come on, let's not stress our brains out. Okay, you guys are young. You do the fun stuff. I'm getting old. I'm doing the easy stuff. All right. Anyways, that's my little review of um, ionic compounds, polyatomic compounds, and balancing. It takes practice, and believe me, you don't always get these easy, uh, these easy ones here. There, there's a lot of hard ones, and it's trial and error. Uh, just write numbers down and see if it works, and if not, double those numbers and try everything else until you get it. It's not fun, but it's just a concept in chemistry that you you need to get. And and when you see reactions in textbooks and stuff, and they do have these numbers, these coefficients uh, in front of them, start getting used to looking at that and saying, say, what does that mean? So I've got six of these and three of these, and how many atoms in total do I have? And And why is the formula this? Huh? Have you asked yourself that? I, mean, I know you haven't now, but let's ask ourselves that. Why is it ZnCl2, zinc chloride? Why not ZnCl3? All right. And over time, you'll start going like, I don't know what, where zinc is on the periodic table. I don't know what's charged. Well, yes, you do. Because chloride is minus one and you've got two of them. So what's the charge of zinc, everybody? Two plus right? These two pluses will balance out these two minuses, all right? So get used to looking at the numbers and, and, and figuring things out and thinking about it so that you can use this stuff to do the more, you know, slightly more complicated stuff, all right? Anyways, I hope that helped you. Take care.